Okay, welcome everyone to the evolution and uh, oops, enable. Welcome everyone to the evolution and maintenance track. And uh, uh, we have very interesting papers. And as you know, the format is all the papers and the media recordings are available in the program. And this hour is really to make a short summary of each paper, and then we can spend the time on questions and discussions. Uh, so we will quickly just move between each uh, uh, paper. And the first paper is actually a journal paper uh, by Fiorella Sampetti from the University of Sanio, together with uh, John Marco Fucci, and uh, Massimilio Di Penta, also from University of Sanya, and Alexander Serbrenik from Eindhoven University. And the paper is about self-admitted technical debt practices, a comparison between industry and open source. So please, uh, Fiorella, the floor is yours. Can you see my screen? Right? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. OK, so hi to everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Sigrid. Uh, I am Fiorella Zampetti, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Sanya. And uh, as uh, being already mentioned, uh, today I'm uh, going to present the results of our study aimed at comparing what are the self-admitted technical debt practices between industry and open source. This is actually a journal first paper being accepted in 2021 at Empirical Software Engineering. And uh, it is important to highlight that this is a joint work made in collaboration with uh, Endoven University of Technology. First of all, what do we mean when we talk about uh, technical debt? As being defined by Cunningham, technical debt is not quite right code, which we postpone making it right. So, based on, based on top of this definition, uh, Podar and Shiab have introduced a new concept, the one of self-admitted technical debt, referring to technical debt being intentionally admitted by developers by means of source code comments. Uh, previous literature has already investigated what is the impact that self-admitted technical debt has on software quality, together with the, what are the strategies mainly used to introduce and remove them from the code. However, to the best of our uh, knowledge, there is a lack in terms of understanding what are the reasons and circumstances in which developers admit technical debt, and more important, how they cope with them. So in order to address uh, this uh, goal, we have decided to uh, conduct our study entirely relying on semi-structured interviews and uh, a survey, because the main aim is to understand the developers' rational and perception. At this point, uh, let's move on what are the main findings of our study. First of all, in terms of frequency, uh, what we found is that open source contributors tend to admit self-admitted technical debt more if compared to industrial one. So here, our suggestion is that both industrial and open source projects try to find a balance between the desire to ensure quality and promoting an open culture where the awareness of technical debt is encouraged, encouraged and not considered as a bad practices. After that, what we uh, ask a developer was what are the reasons for admitting or not self-admitted technical debt? And here, developers admit to believe, to remember what needs to be improved. However, if the decision rational is not tracked, it could create a track factor. So what we suggest here for developer is to consistently add self-admitted technical debt, but also document the design decision in order to help promoting awareness in the project so that it is possible to support the onboard of newcomers, but also uh, to reduce the likelihood of project abandonment. 
The other dimension that we investigated is related to the channel used to admit the self-admitted technical debt. And here, what we found is that, uh, unsurprisingly, developers rely very common, uh, rely very often to source code comment, but also commit messages pull request and issue. However, there is uh, still 40% of industrial and open source contributors admitting that they simply use internal and private uh, documents. So hindering also in this case, the awareness of the whole uh, team. Uh, when we move at, at what are the content of those kind of uh, annotation, what we found is that uh, usually developers use self-admitted technical debt to uh, not only uh, highlight maintainability and performance problem, but also the need, for instance, to change an API. And these are actually occur more for open source contributors. So here, our conjecture is that open source projects are more likely to use third party components, whereas industrial projects might be subject to strict organizational policies, but also technological constraint. So based on these results, we ask the research community to provide recommenders supporting developers in the choice of the API in order to fix as soon as possible self-admitted technical debt related to uh, API upgrade. As a last dimension, we ask developers to, what are their reaction when they encounter self-admitted technical debt while coding, so while, when completing their development tasks. And here, what we uh, found is that in many cases, self-admitted technical debt is taken into account and also addressed. However, there are still cases where developers try to hide them. So uh, here, even if there are cases where uh, the hiding behavior could be a legitimate behavior, there are still cases where this should be considered as a smelly uh, behavior. And with this, I have concluded my presentation and I am happy to discuss with you and answer your, uh, your questions later on. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that presentation, Fiorella. So the next speaker is Lina Oka from Eindhoven University and the Software Engineering and Technology Group. And she says her research interest is uh, empirical software engineering, software engineering, software analysis, and software evolution. And this is uh, the uh, new ideas and emergency, um, emerging results. And she's already uh, on the near track award so break hooked, analyzing the impact of breaking changes to assist library evolution a paper written together with thomas de jule and sean rami faleri from university of bordeaux in yeah cnrs you have to explain that <laughs> but uh, welcome lena uh, i'm looking forward to hear your summary We see your slides, but we don't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? I wait until you say something. Nothing. Lina? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we want your slides. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So uh, I will briefly introduce Breakout, uh, a bot for assisting library evolution. And this was a paper that we submitted to NIR, uh, to the NIR track. So BreakBot is a GitHub bot. Uh, for Java projects, and basically it analyzes a set of pull requests looking for two things. The first one is like the set of breaking changes that are being introduced in the in the pull request. And we're talking about things such as removing a class or adding an abstract method to a class. And the second thing that it checks for is the impact of such breaking changes on client projects. So in which locations these uh, broken declarations are actually impacting the code. So to understand how useful uh, 
Uh, let's look at an example. Here we have Spoon. Spoon is an open source library uh, that analyzes and transform, uh, transforms Java source code. And basically what happened with Spoon is that in September 2019, they decided to deprecate a set of classes, the input scanner classes, because they introduced new functionality that was supposed to replace them. So they just label it with this annotation. And three months later, in December, they decided to remove the classes. To do so, they created, they created this new pull request. But what, what happened then is that they had like this list of clients that are relevant to them and they are constantly monitoring how the changes impact uh, these uh, client projects. And they discovered that two of these uh, client projects were actually broken because of this change. So what happened then is that two months later in February 2020, they finally restored the input scanner classes so the two broken um, clients could actually uh, build again. So how does Breakbot help in this situation? Um, actually, if they had had like Breakbot install in their repositories, they actually can pinpoint like the pull request that's being created. Uh, Breakbot is an extra check on the pull request and then they could actually uh, read the report that's being generated by Breakbot. Basically, what we highlight here are like the number of breaking changes that are being introduced by the pull request, the number of broken uses in client code, and these are like the broken locations, and the number of clients that are relevant to the to the library that are uh, broken or, or yeah are, are broken by these by these changes. Afterwards, what you can see is the list of breaking changes, the whole list. And here we can we highlighted the, the case of the class removed, the input scanner. And you can see also like the two clients that are being uh, broken. Then you have the whole list of relevant clients that you need to specify, right? And here, for instance, we have Aster. And on top of that, you have also the number of broken users or broken locations, in this case, 15. Uh, if you want to get more details about that, you can go to the Aster uh, summary. And here, for instance, we highlighted the cases uh, related to the removal of the input scanner classes. In this case, we have an invocation of one of the methods declared within uh, those classes and the invocation of one of the constructors. So for future research plans, uh, we have like a list of things that we would like to follow. But uh, for this case, I would like to highlight two of them. First, the discovery of relevant clients, because right now we are a list of relevant clients ourselves. And it would be nice just to discover them uh, in, the, in the given ecosystem, like for instance, in GitHub in an automatic fashion. And then we have Dependabot++, which is more like looking from the client side, right? So it's not just about uh, suggesting a new release that you can include in your dependencies, but more about telling them like, okay, you have this new release, but look how this release can impact you. Does it impact your code or not? And then as a client, you can decide if you go forward or not. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Thanks for attending. And if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, now we go for uh, the next speaker. And the next speaker is Hong Ji Jae. And he's actually a master candidate at the Institute of Software in the Chinese Academy of Science and his research interests are program analysis and knowledge graph and he has written this paper together with Wei Chen who is an associate professor at the same place and, and Wen Chengdu who is an associate professor also and Guang, oh sorry for my pronunciation, uh, Gu Kuang Bu and Zhong Wei are professors at the Institute of Chinese Academy of Science and the knowledge-based environment dependency inference for Python programs. Please welcome Hong Ji. The floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me, voice? Yes, we can hear you and see. Okay, this let's start with uh, our paper. Uh, hello, hello everyone. I'm Ye Hong Jie from Institute of Software Chinese Academy of Science, 
Today, I will introduce our paper entitled Knowledge Based Environment Dependency Inference for Python Programs. Python is a popular programming language and it has a driven and active ecosystem. Thus, people usually do use Python code to improve the development efficiency. To do use a Python code, people can find code snaps on Stack Overflow or GitHub Gates. However, such snaps may be not runnable because they usually list source code without its dependencies. It seems easy to reuse a Python program. User can first install a compatible Python version and then determine and install dependent third-party packages. After that, user can run a program. However, inferring dependencies for a Python program is not trivial. Firstly, standard modules and syntax features restrict the compatible Python versions and secondly, third-party modules indicate the dependent third-party packages of the program, and module names can be inconsistent with the package names. Thirdly, system libraries are important transitive dependencies, and lastly, a package can be required by others at the same time with different version constraints. Users should carefully choose a proper package version. To this end, we propose a knowledge-based approach to infer dependencies for Python program. First, we collect and extract domain knowledge from multiple data sources and construct a knowledge graph, PYKG. Then, we propose a knowledge-based environment dependency inference technique, PyEgo. Given a target Python program, it first extracts its features and then infers its dependencies with the support of the knowledge base. This is our knowledge graph model. It portrays the features of the Python interpreter and the third-party package. And it also portrays the, syst uh, the system libraries, the third-party package, and the Python package, and, the dependency, and their interdependencies. We collected, we collected and adjust knowledge from multiple sources. We analyze Python documents and convert syntax features into regular expressions and we analyze the directory structure to extract modules in different, different levels. We analyze metadata to obtain the compatibility between the Python interpreter and third-party packages, and the dependencies among the third-party packages. And we will also propose a similarity-based mapping method to discover the dependencies between package and libraries. Finally, we can construct a knowledge graph containing hundreds of thousands of entities and millions of operations. In stage two, we propose a approach to infer dependencies for Python programs. Given a target Python program, we extract its features by program analyze and regular expression matching. And we query PYKG for dependency candidates, the candidates for a program-centric subgraph. And in the subgraph, it determines the candidate versions while constraint solving. We propose three constraints and two requirements. And finally, we get a solution containing proper versions of dependency resources. And uh, uh, dependency resources need to be installed. To evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of our work, we propose three research questions and evaluate our work on a three data set. The result shows that our work reaches 46%, 62%, and 61% accuracy on the three data sets. And compared to the Dockerize Me and Pick Request, we reaches the highest accuracy and infers the least third party packages. In conclusion, we propose a knowledge based approach to infer dependencies for Python programs. The approach contains two stages knowledge graph construction and runtime environment generation. That's all, thank you. I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much. That was super interesting, Hongji. And I think everyone who works with Python are always interested of dependency for debugging. So that's a very good thing. So uh, the next speaker now is Jia Chen. And he is a, a PhD student of Fudan University School of Computer Science and his research interests include AI ops and alert data presenting, data processing. <laughs> and he will be presenting online summarizing alerts through semantic and behavior information. 
a paper written together by with the Peng Wang and Wei Wang. This. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slide and we hear you. Okay. Uh, the work I'm going to share is. But maybe uh, speak up a little. Okay. If you can speak a little louder. Yeah, perfect. Uh, the work I'm going to share is online summarizing alerts through semantic and behavior information. And uh, in a real scenario, a failure usually triggers multiple alerts due to the interaction between system components, uh, resulting in a large number of alerts. Uh, although maintenance engineers commonly define some correlation rules to summarize alerts of the same uh, failure, thereby reducing their workload. Um, however, uh, manually defining correlation rules is a, a labor-intensive and time-consuming process. And here is an example. Uh, all these five alerts are triggered by one failure, an uh, NTP start uh, error. To correlate to correlate alerts, we find that alerts belonging to the same failure have similar semantic and behavior information. For the semantic information in this table, all these five alerts describe the same anomaly from different perspectives. And for the behavior information, for the alert of E1 and E2, we construct their current series by uh, counting alert currents of E1 and E2 per one minute in a day. And we can find that uh, uh, these two types of alerts occur in the same time periods, and the fluctuations of the two series are similar. Therefore, we propose an online alert summarizing approach named OAS to summarize alerts into incident. Each, inf each incident contains alerts of the same anomaly, and it has three major components, ASR, ABR, and ACT. ASR not only mines the contextual information of each alert world, but also consider, considers the contribution of each world to the overall alert semantics. And uh, for ABR, it captures the commonality between the current series of correlated alerts by a new network. And ACT, it measures the correlation between alerts by aggregating the semantic and behavior features extracted from SR and APR. And here is an overview of our approach. Our approach has two stages, training stage and summarizing stage. In training stage, we first pass alerts to get alert content words. We first pass alerts to remove parameters in contents and then remove subwords from alert contents. After that, we group alerts into different types according to their contents. Then we calculate their current series by counting their frequency per, one, per alpha minute in the past beta minutes. Then we train the semantics representation model, ASR, and the behavior representation model, ABR. ASR and ABR have no dependency. They can be trained separately. Uh, finally, we train the alert correlation model, ACT, to measure the correlation between alerts by the mind, semantics, and behavior information from ASR and ABR. Uh, the alert correlations for training can be retrieved from history of failure reports uh, written by maintenance engineers. In summarizing stage, we summarize a newly reported alert by a time window for the newly reported uh, by, a, by a time window. We similarly process alerts to get alert content words and current series. Then we directly extract uh, the semantic and behavior information of the alerts by the representation models SR and BR, which are trained in the uh, training stage. And then, we, and then we can measure the correlation between the newly generated alert and the previous reported alerts during the time window. According to alert correlations found by ACT, we summarize the newly reported alert by appending it to an existing incident or constructing a new incident for the new alert. And uh, that's a, a summary of our 
study. Uh, thanks for your listening. That was very interesting. Yeah, I think yeah, having alerts that is time frame is a very good advancement, and having a tool that supports that is good. So, very nice. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and the next speaker now is uh, Rosalia Tufano from uh, University. Università della Svizzera Italiana, together with uh, sure. Scarella, Emma and Agjani, or, and Gabriel Bavota. No, yeah, or Gabriel Bavota, that all yeah. are from the same university, and together with uh, Rocco Olivieto, and who is, and Simone Scalabrino, who is from University of Molise. And you're going to describe using and reinforcement learning for load testing in video games. I love load testing, so I'm looking forward to this. So, okay. Uh, and we hear you and we see the slides. So go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Sigrid, for the introduction. So hello, everyone. And my name is Rosalia Tufano. So today I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna present you the work using reinforcement learning for load testing of video games, in which we propose an approach to support game developers in the testing phase of video games. More precisely, we investigated the possibility of using reinforcement learning for a specific type for a specific type of um, game testing that is load testing. So load testing is the process of stressing the game and measure, measuring its response, searching for possible performance issues. Now, in this work, we focus in particular on a specific type of performance issue experienced by gamers, namely parts of the game exhibiting a drop of frame per second, so making the game less, uh, making the game less fluid. So what happens during load testing is that humans play for hours trying to identify such area, areas of the game and um, that we call here uh, low FPS points. Uh, this activity uh, requires a smart interaction with the game because we need to advance in the game in order to be able to uh, test the entire game environment. So uh, to reduce the human effort in this expensive activity, we propose to replace the human tester with a smart to play the game as a human tester would. So to build such an agent, one of the options is to use reinforcement learning, that is a machine learning technique based on the simple idea of trial and error. So in reinforcement learning, we have an agent interacting uh, with an environment with a precise goal. It, the agent can perform um, some defined actions in the environment, and based on the performed actions, it receives a reward. The reward is strictly related to the agent's goal, and it is a sort of feedback about um, how good it is performing in the environment. So at the beginning, the agent tries to uh, perform some random actions, and then try by try, observing the rewards, it learns how to properly act to reach uh, its goal. So we propose Reline, an approach that exploits reinforcement learning to support game developers in the load testing activity. So we have three main blocks. Uh, we have the game, the reward function, and the, the reinforcement learning model that represent here the agent. So the game provides the reinforcement learning model with a representation of the game states in the current moment. And uh, it can be, for example, the screenshot of the monitor. Then the reinforcement learning model based on the game state decides uh, which action to perform and send this information to the game. The game executes the action of the player and provides the word function with two kinds of information. Uh, game information that can be, uh, for example, the current score in the game um, or the position of the agent in the game, uh, that helps the agent understand how to play the game. And the FPS information, so the time the game takes to render the next frames after the chosen action, uh, that helps the agent learn how to identify uh, such areas of the game that we uh, defined as low FPS points. So the reward function, finally, using these informations, computed the reward and send it to the reinforcement learning model. Now, to evaluate Reline, we uh, decided to evaluate it on a 3D open source game um, that is Super Tux Kart. It is a kart in which uh, it is a game uh, in which the player has to drive along the track and uh, reach 
finish line. So to evaluate our approach, we compared the agent trained with Reline with a reinforcement learning baseline, uh, meaning that the agent in this case was trained just to play and win the game, and a random agent that simply performs some random actions. And here we have uh, the results about how many low FPS point, uh, points each agent was able to spot. And so we can notice that Reline found the, um, the highest number of low FPS points, but also the random agent was uh, quite good, better than the reinforcement learning baseline. But the problem with the random agent is that um, since it is not able to play, it finds low FPS points uh, only in the first part of the track. And moreover, sometimes it goes and spots low FPS points um, in area of the game that are unlikely to be considered by a real human player. So this concludes my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Rosalia. That was interesting how you improved on the low thank testing. You. Yeah. So let's now open up the room for discussions and questions. And so we already have a first question here from Lina to Hongji. And how do you deal with cases uh, where you get multiple solutions? Do you suggest all possible solutions to the developer or do you pick one? So Hongji, could you answer that? <laughs> Oh, so sorry, I can cannot follow the questions. Can you repeat it again? But it's in the chat. If you look in the chat, okay, okay. It's fine. Yes. It's, uh, you see that little uh, speak bubble up in the corner and press that. You probably see uh, the question. Where can I find the question? Up, up right corner. Up. Bubble. Uh, Make a picture. <laughs> <laughs> you find uh, it? No. No. Chat list. No. Chat, chat list, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. If you want, I can just ask you. So if I understood correctly, what you try to do is to find like the, the versions uh, that you require or the developer requires to run like a notebook or whatever you have, right? Um, <laughs> so, so sorry. Uh, I. I'm having you to follow the questions. No, 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 but I haven't, I haven't done, I, I haven't asked you the question yet. So, but can you hear me well or? or? Uh, I can hear you, but I cannot follow your questions. My English is no, but, sorry. Yeah, but my question is if it can happen that you get like multiple versions for a given scenario. Oh. Right, and if it if it's the case, how do you pick one, or do you suggest all of them to the developer? Oh, oh. Uh, I I follow the two uh, requirements. The first requirement is we install packages as new as possible. For example, uh, version is one point two, and uh, version is uh, one point five, and both of them are okay. The one point five is preferred, and we. I recommend this version to the user and the second uh, and the second requirement is install packages as few as possible if a newer version install requires more sensitive dependencies we may be prefer to uh, recommend the old, uh, the, the old version to the user and uh, that's all Okay, thanks. Oh, Sigrid, we cannot hear you. You're muted. Yes, I can be muted. <laughs> so I said, Max, would you speak, uh, unmute yourself and uh, and ask your question to Rosalia? Yes. Uh, uh, asking. So a typical uh, frame rate drop scenario is when you have many agents or animated objects uh, uh, visible at the same time, like you have too many cars in a racing game. And uh, yes. uh, do you handle that? Did, did you see a similar situation or how would you handle this kind of case? Yes, thank you for your question. So 
first in our scenario uh, we have only one agent so we never checked with more agents but uh, yeah something that can happen is that the agent learns uh, by itself uh, that when there are more objects uh, um that is this kind of situation in which there is a drop of frame per seconds in fact we uh if i'm not wrong we spotted one of these cases one of these cases in which there was the agent that um, um made a strange move and moving uh, its uh, its position uh, there were other objects in the um, in the game and so it was um, spotted as a low fps point so yes i guess that the the agent can can learn these situations and something that we can do for um, let's say when we have more agent uh, is to maybe to um, uh, put in the same environment different reinforcement learning agents that can uh, play together and see if uh, uh, if they are able to spot these situations. Yes. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so I have a question to Lina. How do you plan to evaluate the benefits of your vision that you presented here in the near paper? Okay, thanks, thanks for the question. So basically we want to evaluate it following like three or considering three aspects. First, like the accuracy of the of the tool because without that we will just add noise to the repositories and then that's not something that developers want to see the second point is performance because uh, we had like this point in time where it was taking quite long to perform the analysis of or the detection of the broken uses and the third aspect is, is like concerns the usability or the usefulness of the of the of breakout right so is it really helping developers on accepting or rejecting pull requests? Pull requests are the things that they want to check or they want to check commits. So all these aspects are something that we want to, to investigate in the future. Okay, thank you. That was a good one. So I have another question to you, Gia. Uh, which kind of application can your techniques uh, be applied to can you give some examples? Okay. Uh, we have cooperated with, uh, I have a hard time hearing you. Speak up, speak up. Speak uh, can up. you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we have cooperated <laughs> with some companies. And uh, in this compa companies, strictly speaking, uh, for each art, a uh, work code should be constructed and, as and be assigned to the frontline maintenance engineer. But uh, uh, if we construct a, a work order for each art, there will be a large number of work orders for the maintenance engineers, and uh, that is beyond their capabilities. And our approach o OAS can be applied to this scenario. Uh, we can uh, correlate, correlate alerts of the same anomaly into incidents, and uh, we can construct a work order for each incident and thereby reducing the number of work orders. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So, Fiorella, you have a question in the chat. Do you want to speak up, Gabriel? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether Gabriele wants to ask it uh, directly. Yeah, ask it directly. Just unmute yourself, I think. Should I'm work. trying. Okay, now it should work. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah the question is uh, whether you found something related to software licenses in terms of technical debt, because I guess uh, there is where you can observe a difference between open source and industrial. And if this could be related to your finding about APIs, because maybe, you know, they don't use a lot of third party components because they may have issues with software licenses, which is something maybe a little bit different in open source so if you if you have something about that actually uh among our respondents 
uh, no one uh, said nothing about uh, uh, problems related to license. Of course, uh, based on our conjecture and our understanding, when we talk about specific, uh, specific technological constraint and also some strict policies that industrial developers could have if compared to open source contributors, actually this is one of the aspects that uh, we may look at uh, also in the future because of course uh, a license could be a huge problem for uh, for what's concerned in that some project actually great it makes sense thanks yeah. thank you i i actually also have a question to you fiorella uh, so i think it's very interesting you look at comments and developer comments and Maybe uh, I'm a bit uneducated uh, or my industry is on comments. So, I mean, uh, how, what, what advice would you really give to developers who are a bit reluctant because they think it's getting old and it's not accurate and who cares if you read the code, etc. So what, what, what would you say to them? Yes, uh, actually, one of uh, our findings is that uh, industrial developers tend to have much fear of admitting that something is wrong in the piece of code that they are uh, written. So actually, this is also um, the reason why uh, develop there are many cases where self-admitted technical debt is admitted in private and internal uh, documents. Of course, uh, our idea and our suggestion is to use not only source code comments, but also try to use them uh, together with issue trackers, for instance. So uh, it is uh, um, the code became much more readable. The all the people will have awareness in terms of what are the problems with the code, but all the details related to the technical debt must be tracked in a different place. Okay, because I, I mean, I don't think it's fair in my company. I, our developers are fearless completely. I think they're much more lazy. Yeah. They don't want to, you know, and, and then it's going to yeah, be obsolete anyway, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. but this is also the case yeah. when we uh, say that uh, developers believe to remember. So, pro probably this belief is related to I don't want to do, and um, but actually, this will create problems when there are other people that uh, join in and must modify the piece of code that you, you have touched before. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. I think a lot of us use to do's in our code. <laughs> so I guess there is some, some, <laughs> but uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So is there any um, other question? I yeah. have another question for Fiorella, if I can. So um, <laughs> the um, self technical debt comment that you showed the, during the slide. So for example, the to do comments, um, mm -hmm. do you think they seems to me like a sort of, um, self review if you want so do you think uh, they can be used to um, uh, to train a model that is able to fix this kind of issues based on the description of the um, this kind of comments actually i think that uh, if the comments contain enough details it could be possible to use them for uh, probably a uh, train model uh, to identify where actually the comment uh, go out uh, in the sense that the uh, developer is actually fixing and probably forget to remove the comments mm. from uh, from the code. But uh, here the problem is how, mm, how many details the developer is actually adding to the content of the comment. Actually. Yeah, yeah. And also I think the um, understand what is the code changes that fix the the problem yeah. so the, the the building of the data set i think it's not uh, really easy yeah <laughs> okay thank you no. but i think i saw another paper here at ICSE where they have uh, trained actually and replaced comments with more content uh, i i don't know in what track but i read that somewhere that you could sort of replace the actual comment with the the more content of the code they did that as a machine learning so 
I, maybe it was in the, the other other evolution track, Max. I'm not sure, but uh, I th I think you have a look at it. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting approach, also because that could maybe be a way to improve on commenting. Of course, that's not the same as handling technical depth. Uh, and and my experience is technical depth. I I more I don't look at it as source code only. I mean I look at it in all kinds of systems. So so, and yeah, <laughs> I wish we had it more upfront. <laughs> that would be yeah. probably smart. Uh, like a like a way to announce you have work to do and you don't have time to do it. So okay. So, do we have any other questions in the team or chat? I think I have uh, one more question that I wrote here. I have a little cheat paper. Uh, so, uh, this question is to Hongji. Uh, and the question is, how efficient is constraint solving? in um, resolving dependency conflicts right uh, okay i i see it uh, I, uh it takes about 20 percent to 30 percent of the total execution time i think it's efficient enough uh because it, on one hand the performance bottleneck is uh, database query it takes about 15 percent to 16 percent uh time of the total execution. And on the other hand, we only store limited versions in our knowledge base. And it is, and, and the constraint solving scale is not large, it's, it's not too large. It, there's only about hundreds or thousands of nodes and relations when during a constraint solving. It is easy for the constraint solver to tackle this problem. Okay. So, so what kind of uh, efficient? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of uh, constraint solver do you use? I'm sure it's in the paper, but I. Oh, uh, I use the uh, Zsh3. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. Um. So, do we have any other cool questions here? In my. Okay, I have a question to Lina. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see that you you will discover the client project in the future. Do you have any uh, any idea about how to discover the client project? I'm interested in it. Yeah. Well, that that's a great question, and um, basically. For us, first, like the, the the first thoughts were like, yeah, we need to check like these big clients. If we impact these big clients that are being used by many many other projects, then this this is like this, you will get like this ripple effect that will just uh, impact the whole ecosystem. So, thinking about the ecosystem, this would be like the first uh, thing to think about. But we have also seen that you do not have clients, you do not only care about those clients. For instance, if you have like a commercial relationship with a client, then you would like to not impact in a bad manner, like one of these clients that might not be that popular among um, your, yeah, your ecosystem, right? But then if we think about uh, like these open source community, we would opt to go for this, but then still we need to allow the developer to specify certain constraints so they can kind of guide the the search of these or the discovery of these client projects okay i know thank you yeah great so we have a wonderful audience do you have any questions to any one of the authors or any author to any other author no No discussion, everything crystal clear. I think it's actually pretty great that you can see the media beforehand personally and read the papers because it gives you sort of advanced. And and I also think the summary clarifies it a lot. So uh, it's very helpful. And of course the technical papers are and journal papers, they are so well written. So 
<laughs> we all know it's perfect, right? So I don't know if I can fabricate any more questions. Uh, we could maybe move over to the social room or uh, move over to the uh, next uh, session. I may It might be some other session you're interested in, but I really would like to thank the authors. They have done such a great job uh, in presenting, and I know it's a tough call. So, yeah, share your hand clapping with everyone. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone's around for answering questions, okay? So, bye-bye for now. Thank you. And bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.